Hello, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started in just a couple minutes. We want to thank everyone for showing up for today's program. Uh, just to make sure you all are in the right spot, we are here today for our July C2C Care webinar. Uh, today's webinar is going to be about choosing and using safe materials for collections housing. We'll be running from about 1 p.m. Eastern to 2 p.m. Eastern, and we will have a Q&A period afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead and start by sharing my screen and running through a couple of quick intro slides. Okay. So again, uh, welcome to the program today. Um, and this is the program you're here for today. As a reminder, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. I'm located just outside of Washington, DC in Silver Spring, Maryland. So I welcome our audience to say hello in the chat and maybe say where they're located from, which is always a fun thing to see. Um, you are also more than welcome to see what the weather is, even though I think right now in the deep, in the states, at least everywhere is just hot. So, but if you feel free to share that if you would like. If you're new to our program, I always like to kind of do a quick shout out to our website, connectingtocollections.org. On that website, you will find a full archive of our program. C2C Care has been around for over 10 years, so there's quite a history of courses and webinars on there. So I encourage you to go take a look if you're interested in anything to do with collections care. You can also get links to our community, which is a great resource. If you have a question related to direct care, you can pop a question on our community tab and a fabulous group of monitors and experts will be there to answer your question. So I encourage you to take a look at that. We also have curated resources. So if you're in case you're interested in anything dealing with the museum world and collections, I encourage you to go check out that website. We have two homes on social media where we post announcements and other things as well. Um, one of them is on Facebook and the other one is on the network formerly known as Twitter. Our handle on both is at C2C Care. So I encourage you to follow those if you're on either of those social networks. A couple of super quick technical reminders. Um, as Because this is a Zoom webinar, we have enabled the chat feature, which you guys are using very well. So I don't think I needed to describe that at all. But the chat is there really just to say hello and to um, maybe put question, just general comments in that area. Um, the Q&A is for questions. So if you have a direct question for our presenter at any point during the program, I encourage you to put it in that Q&A box, not the chat box. As you all can see, the chat box turns into a stream of consciousness. So if you have a good question, make sure to put it in the Q&A box so we can track it throughout the program. We have also enabled um, closed captioning on this. We have a captioner working diligently away, so we are thankful for their service as we do our program today. And we are recording today's program. The program will be posted online on our website and on YouTube by the end of the week, most likely. So keep an eye out for those as well. A quick programming note for C2C Care. Um, as many of you know, we do one free webinar a month. So our August webinar is all about safeguarding collections. Um, it's scheduled for August 20th at from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. I do encourage you to go take a look at the description of that webinar. Um, we actually have two people presenting on kind of how to be an advocate for when uh, folks want to come in and do fun things like record in your collection space or do promotional events and all that. So it's really going to be talking from a collection standpoint on how you can advocate and protect your collections while still working with the fabulous folks on the event and promotional staff of your institution to make sure everything is safe. So I encourage you to go take a look at that. We've also just announced a course for this fall, C2C Care course, all about developing a collections management policy. The course coordinator for that course is going to be uh, Becca Kennedy from Curie Collections. She's going to be using all sorts of great resources in the help of developing a collections management course, including podcasts, other recorded webinars, other resources. So if you're in the process of developing a CMP, um, we encourage you to maybe take a look. Maybe that course will help you and kind of help you kind of figure out the fun of that actual document. Um, as a reminder for our C2C Care courses, because they're a little bit more in depth of a program, we do charge for them, but there is an early bird rate. So I encourage you to go take a look at that and sign up for that course. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and go ahead and throw this over to our presenter today, Samantha Springer, who's an objects conservator. Um, Samantha is going to be talking to us all about the 
way that we can look at materials and different items for collection stores and exhibitions. Um, there's been some new stuff coming out recently, so we thought this would be a great time to talk about it. So Samantha, feel free to take over whenever you're ready, and we will be back for the Q&A portion at the end of the program. Okay, thanks, Robin. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And um, thanks, everyone, for being here. It is really fun to see such um, people from all over North America and around the world. So thanks everyone for being here. Um, and I wanted to start by thanking FAIC, Nicole Grabo and Robin for organizing this um, webinar today. I'm excited to be speaking on the topic of materials testing as part of the C2C webinar series. And over the next hour, we'll be talking about testing methods used to inform material choices for storage and display. Um, or as we might joke, how conservators choose the boring white stuff and what the heck is the Audi test? So before I launch into our topic, I wanted to just give you a bit of information on my background. Um, as Robin said, I'm an objects conservator by training and you can find out more about my education and previous experience on my website um, and my profile on the AIC Find a Professional tool. Um, my business, Art Solutions Lab, works with a range of institutions, most of which don't have um, conservators on staff. Um, and I can help them find the best solutions for their problems and get the most preservation bang for their buck. So hopefully we can help you with that too. Um, almost 15 years ago, I was doing a lot of Audi testing at the Cleveland Museum of Art and worked with my colleague there, Colleen Snyder, to establish a place to share test results on the AIC Wiki. And I don't actually do any testing anymore, but um, over the past 15 years, I have continued to maintain and improve the pages on the Wiki as they have grown with increased contributors and users to help others share their work. Um, I am also a member of AIC's Materials Working Group, and it is through that work that I was connected with the C2C for today's program. Okay, so choosing and using safe materials with our collections is a really huge topic, um, and recently there has been more interest in understanding the testing methods used to distinguish safe materials from those that are unsafe. <clears throat> there are many resources out there on materials commonly recommended for use with collections. I am not going to go through that, but um, I will uh, share with you some new resources that are out there. Um, and I also just wanted to start with some context about the vulnerabilities of the stuff that we are trying to preserve, the threats that they are exposed to, and where and how they are exposed. Um, so in other words, the context of how the products, how are used with artifacts. And then I'll finish up with a discussion on the various testing methods that we use to evaluate products. So my goal um, for today is that at the end of the webinar, you will have a more familiarity with the testing methods so that when you see test results described in product literature, you have a better understanding about what that means or doesn't mean for that matter. Um, and I hope to provide a framework for how we might think about the challenge and highlight some key resources that have more in-depth information that you can go to for specific questions and answers. So throughout the presentation, you will see this key icon um, that's at the bottom of the screen, identifying key resources, all of which are listed on the handout that will be made available to you. Okay, so let's step back a second and look at the broader picture of why this topic is important. So according to the IMLS's Health, Heritage Health um, Index survey or information survey published in 2019, almost half of institutions reported damage to collections um, due to improper storage or enclosures in the prior two years. And I can see my arrow uh, shifted down. It's supposed to be pointing at that um, bar, the second from the bottom. So this is really an area where we can improve care and make a really big impact towards preserving collections. 
So let's talk about why the choice of materials is important and why it is a difficult challenge. So to store stuff, um, we have a lot of stuff that we wanna keep around for as long as possible. And so we need to choose stuff. Um, so it's logical that we want to materials that are to the greatest extent possible, stable and inert, meaning they are unreactive, either to due to the environment which they are used or the materials which, with which they are in contact so that they won't harm our stuff. And our goal is to prevent change or damage to collections. So how do we choose the right products for storage and exhibit and transport? This is really hard to do because there are so many ways in which our choices are constrained. So what do we, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, what do we mean by right or best? So we want materials that are stable, um, but how do we know? And where can we find that information? We want materials that we can afford. We recognize the reality that most high quality materials are more expensive um, and our budgets are always stretched no matter the size of our institution or organization, and now more so than ever. We want materials that won't hurt our planet or the people who produce the materials. So environmental and social sustainability is only increasing in importance to us as we make our choices. And sometimes even when we know what we want, we can't get it. Um, vendor agreements, shipping issues, availability, and other mundane logistics can limit our options. Oh, sorry, <laughs> availability, yeah. Um, so when we are forced to make these hard choices and perhaps choose between the lesser of two evils, um, it's important to think about what our collections are vulnerable to. So what are their greatest risks? Um, Good quality housing materials are expensive, and sometimes we simply may not be able to afford what we want or in the quantities we need. And when that is the case, um, we have to recognize that we may get what we pay for. But to use our limited resources wisely, uh, we can be thoughtful about where we deploy the good stuff, using it on the collections where it is most important. Which brings us to our first key resource in making these choices. Okay, so this relatively new book, Preventive Conservation Collection Storage, published in 2019, has a huge wealth of information on this topic. So through its eight sections, 36 chapters, and 900 plus pages authored by over 100 colleagues throughout our field, this book is literally a huge resource for how we think about storage. Um, another key resource for assessing vulnerability is the Canadian Conservation Institute's Technical Bulletin 32 by Jean Tetreau, who actually recently retired. Um, there are three tables that are um, kind of, you should pay close attention to, and they are important in assessing vulnerability of our collections. And shown here is table one, which charts damage that occurs to objects by airborne pollutants emitted by products. Table two outlines damage that occurs to objects by direct contact with products. And then table three details damage that occurs to objects by the incorrect use of products. So this bulletin um, is truly a key resource for this entire topic of choosing materials. And when you check it out, because I know you will, um, you'll see that I relied on his structure for this presentation. So you can purchase it uh, print version through CCI's website, um, but an online version is also freely available. And the link is in today's handout. Okay. So this brings us to assessing the threat of a product. So we can start by asking questions about the product itself. You might already be doing this kind of subconsciously, but it's good to break down the process into steps. Okay, so we want to ask about the chemical composition and its formation process. 
This will help identify any potential short or long-term source of pollutants. So sometimes we can mine useful information from the product's SDS or safety data sheet. And on the screen now, you can see the SDS for polypropylene pellets or resin. Um, so um, important sections to focus on when reviewing the SDS are highlighted on the slide in red. Um, in section one is the contact information for a person at the company that where these pellets are made. Um, in section three, you can find the composition of product of the product and ingredient names. And in section nine, the physical and chemical properties of the components. So if we look back at section three, um, at the lower left of the slide, you will see that looking at the SDS won't necessarily give you all the information that you need. So here we see that some ingredients are uh, identified as proprietary stabilizers and identified as trade secrets. So um, this may just be the first stop on your quest. Jean Tetreau advises us that next we should consider the product's physical properties like porosity, strength, flexibility, and abrasiveness to make sure it is compatible with our intended use. And then we want to investigate how the material will age or perform over time. So we know that most of the materials we use are not designed for the preservation of museum collections. Uh, so we have to be vigilant and recognize that manufacturers can change product formation and production in ways that may impact us um, without us ever knowing. Even if the product ostensibly looks and performs the same. This is important when looking at test results for a product. So, things you might ask yourself are how long ago was this test done? Did I buy my product from the same manufacturer, even if it has the same name? And maybe, did I buy it from the same supplier as the tester? Um, and then, how are we using these products? So in this figure from the CCI bulletin, we see that damaging acetic acid emissions of some paints and sealants um, level off after off-gassing for about a month. So it becomes safer to use after a period of time, even if it is more dangerous immediately after its application. But the cellulose acetate film, which starts out stable, begins off-gassing after decades, after it begins to break down. Okay, so if you are not familiar with Cameo, C-A-M-E-O, um, this is another tremendous resource that you should be aware of. Conservation and Art Materials Encyclopedia Online is a database hosted by the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. The resource compiles, defines, and disseminates technical information on the terms, materials, and techniques used in the fields of art conservation and historic preservation. For over 20 years, MFA staff, conservation scientists, and other volunteers have been adding information to this site, making it a really amazing resource of information. And by browsing one of the reference collections, you can see the links to the, this is their main page, but there's links to reference collections, um, or searching for a specific material using the search field in the upper right, uh, you can find information about the components or ingredients for a lot of specific products used in conservation and preservation. So the page I'm showing here is an entry for chipboard or also known as particle board. They also usually have a section for um, other names that synonyms and related terms, um, the second entry there. Um, so the red arrow here highlights um, a section that you might want to pay attention to, the collections risk section, which provides information on the VOCs or volatile organic compounds that may interact poorly with collections. So you can use this information with Jean Tetreault's tables to correlate vulnerability and threats and where these two overlap, 
that's where you will have a higher risk of causing change or damage to your object. So in the CCI bulletin, Jean discusses that the probability and extent of damage to an object by a product's emissions also depends on their context. So let's talk about that. Okay, so this context can really be identified by three main parameters that I've listed here on the slide. So contact, the proximity between a product and an object, whether or not they touch each other. Um, two, uh, the enclosure. So the surface area of the emissive products in the enclosure compared to the volume within the enclosure and its air tightness. So how much airflow do you have um, within your enclosure without the outside air? And then finally, length of exposure. So this is the length of time a product and an object occupy the same space and can interact with each other. Okay, so a product that might cause damage if used as part of the construction or um, within an airtight vitrine might not cause damage in the more open environment of a storeroom. For example, wood may be a common construction material for crate because of its strength and durability, and it's typically used for a short period of time, short use. Um, but it is an undesirable material to use in storage where it will have a long exposure time. So I'm not going to go into this concept further um, or in much detail, but it goes back to the idea that you may be able to mitigate a lower quality material by thinking about the context in which you use it. So ask yourself, is this, um, am I using it only for temporary use? maybe for transit rather than long-term storage in my example. Um, don't forget that although materials we sometimes think of as temporary wind up being, well, not. Um, and here we have two images of damage caused by bubble wrap that were probably applied with the idea that it would only be there for a short period of time. In the top image, the bubbles have, last, have left a lasting impression on the surface of a painting. And in the bottom image, the bubble wrap was in direct contact with this um, piece of stone for 20 years. And it appears that the plasticizers leached out and left this bubble pattern staining on the stone surface. So this might not have happened if there was some sort of barrier layer um, or interleaving between the bubble wrap and the object surface, um, or maybe, um, or, or it may not have happened if the bubble wrap was used for only a few days rather than decades. So context is important since these concepts apply not just to storage, but also to how we think about materials we choose for exhibition and transport. Okay, and when we talk about storage, we assume that there's a long-term time frame. But for exhibits, we may be talking about a temporary exhibition of just a few months or a long-term exhibits that are in place for years or decades even. If you want to better understand when to choose between a tight storage display case to keep out dust and pests or because you'll be using desiccants like silica gel, um, as opposed to when it is beneficial to use a, a leaky um, kind of ventilated, dis purposefully ventilated display case that won't trap in pollutants, you should check out this resource on AIC's wiki site. The exhibition guidelines and best practices page discusses how to integrate preservation concerns into the exhibit um, and exhibit design and production process. Okay, so now that we have looked at how to determine the vulnerabilities of our collection object, the threats it may be exposed to, and the context um, in which it is exposed to potentially harmful products, we can look at how we evaluate those products. So I hope that the information that I've gone over so far 
um, leading up to this topic helped you to see that you can gain a lot of information about a product um, and how to use it with collections without ever even doing any testing. Um, testing might not be possible at your organization. In some cases, it may not even be necessary. Um, so, but let's look at this topic a little more closely so you can understand the meaning of test results in product literature um, or in some of the resources that I've shared that have um, test results in them. Okay, so there are a number of ways in which conservation scientists and conservators evaluate the potential threat of a material in a given context. And there are some important publications on this topic if you want to go into depth. Um, Pam Hatchfield's book, Pollutants in the Museum Environment, discusses sources of pollutants, damage, testing, and mitigation with useful appendices. Jean Tetreau has written further on this topic, so it's not just the bulletin, but this book um, on airborne pollutants is in the, shown in the center publication. Is useful. And the book on the right by Nancy Odegaard, Scott Carroll, and Werner Zimt um, is a go-to text on spot testing. And I hope that these books may be available to you at your organization's library or through library loan. But if getting into this is too granular for you, then I would recommend that the collection storage book as a broader context resource. And section six of the collection storage book focuses in on storage equipment and materials. So if this is the topic you're interested in, you can just zip ahead to chapters 30 through 33, where the processes used to evaluate materials for storage are covered. Um, chapter 30 has an in-depth table on materials that are considered most stable, less stable, and unsuitable. Pam Hatchfield, the author of that chapter, distills a lot of information from her book on pollutants here. Um, chapters 31, 32, and 33 give details on various wood, paper, and plastic materials and how they can interact with our collections in storage. And then in chapter 33, Scott Williams's extensive tables give examples of hazards associated with various plastics in storage. Okay, so now um, evaluating those products. So there are a variety of tests that can be used to assess materials for their suitability for use with collections. The list on this slide is generally in order from low tech to high tech. Um, all of the testing, except for some of the pH tests, require at the very least some sort of um, personal safety equipment and knowledge of safe lab practices to ensure the proper handling and disposable, the disposal of materials, like the testing materials, not the product itself. Um, I'm not going to go over step-by-step -step instructions about the various tests, as there are instructions for um, most of these on the AIC wiki or in the publications I mentioned. Um, I will go over what is involved in the test, um, what it helps us determine, and some of the pros and cons of each test. So for anyone interested in carrying out any of these tests, um, they would really need to acquire the necessary lab equipment and then likely require a hands-on training to learn how to perform them to get meaningful results. These methods of evaluation generally fall into three categories of testing that I have listed here. So you have microchemical tests, accelerated aging, and instrumental analysis. And as you might expect, the low-tech tests are the most affordable, um, but they also give us the least accurate results. Uh, microchemical tests can be used to identify materials within products, specific materials within products. Um, accelerated aging tests are used to predict how a product might impact an artifact when used in close proximity and instrumental methods are used to identify or predict the behavior of a material when used within the confines of a cultural organization. 
Instrumentation is costly um, and requires highly trained staff uh, to run. Reading and interpreting, interpreting results also requires practice and training. However, um, that those tests take a relatively short amount of time to run and you will get much more accurate results in terms of identification of the compounds and at what concentration they are present in the product. Okay, so let's dig into microchemical tests. Uh, the most commonly used to evaluate products are pH tests, um, lead acetate, spot test to detect sulfur and the Bielstein test to detect chlorine. So many of you are likely familiar with pH pens um, or indicator strips. Maybe you last used them when you were in high school chemistry. Um, these are all available at most preservation suppliers. Um, the test is typically used on paper products used for housing like corrugated board or mat board. Um, is, this, is a this test will not predict how the pH of a product will change over time, um, but it will tell you what the pH is at the time the test is done. So this can be helpful for knowing when it's time to replace your housing materials, um, like interleaving, or to differentiate, maybe you have a stockpile of supplies and you don't know if they um, are okay to use. So you can differentiate between good and poor quality materials. So for the next two tests, the two um, more um, involved tests, a sample of the product is tested for the presence of sulfur in the case of the lead acetate or chlorine for the Bielstein test. And both sulfur and chlorine are known to cause corrosion and unwanted changes to artifacts. So the image on the left shows the open flame required for the Bielstein test. Um, which turns green in the presence of chlorine. So you actually take a sample and put it into the flame to um, identify if chlorine is present. And then on the right is an image of various samples being tested for the presence of sulfur using that lead acetate test, um, which requires the use of reagents to produce a chemical reaction. And then the pH of the resulting um, reaction is measured to confirm the presence, presence of sulfur or not. Um, the lead acetate and Bielstein tests are most commonly used as a quick and kind of initial method to weed out potentially problematic materials to prevent having to carry out um, more labor and time intensive tests like the ADI test. So that leads us to accelerated aging. Okay. So of the accelerated aging tests, the ADI test is probably the most well-known. Um, it was named after Andrew Adi, who developed the use of a reactivity test in the 1970s at the British Museum. So this accelerated aging test is used to detect volatile compounds that could damage collection objects. The test is highly subjective, but it is accessible in a way that instrumental analytical techniques are, are not. And so the test continues to be widely used despite its known flaws. Um, it is considered a really good way of ruling out inappropriate materials and professionals can use their judgment based on vulnerability, threats, and context that we've already looked at to determine if a material is okay for perhaps temporary exhibit use, um, but not for long-term storage use. Um, and it is a, it's not designed to be a simple yes or no, but a tool used in conjunction with the other research and um, knowledge of the product. So to carry out that test, a product sample is enclosed in a sealed container with three suspended metal coupons. And so there's an image of it, an Audi test um, at the lower left of the screen. So those coupons are silver, copper, and lead. And then a small amount of water is also included inside the enclosed container, the sealed container. Um, that, uh, in this case of the jar, the sealed jar is then artificially aged in the hot oven at 60 degrees Celsius for 28 days. So that's why the test takes so long. Um, 
The metal coupons are then assessed for changes. And so, and they're judged by, vis by visibly looking at them. Um, there are some studies that have been done to see if they can use um, different scanning techniques and computers in order to assess the um, changes to the, to the coupons, but the way that is most commonly used is just to um, observe them by eye. So a major flaw um, with this test is the subjectivity and inconsistency between testers. Um, also, those inconsistencies exist because of variations in how tests are carried out. So it leads to a real difficulty in re replicating results. Um, recently, there has been a lot of research done by members of the materials working group to standardize testing methods and the assessment of results. So there's more standardized language um, and specific types of changes that you're looking for. If you are interested in starting a testing program at your organization, there are some new resources on the Wiki, AIC Wiki Audi test page, um, planning a program and running a program so that you can get started or just determine if this is something that you um, are able to do and take on at your organization. Okay, so next I'll discuss the PAT, um, the photographic activity test. This test looks at possible chemical interactions between enclosures and photographic images after long-term storage. So photographic images are also metallic in nature. So think about silver gelatin, platinum prints, palladium prints. Um, the image at the right shows the layers of material used in the test, which has been standardized as ISO 18916. You can look it up to find, um, to read the actual testing process. I think you might have to purchase it. Um, it was established by and can be carried out on product samples at the Image Permanence Institute or IPI. Um, some preservation vendors will mention that a particular material or product has passed the PAT test. In that case, it, the test was probably carried out by IPI. Um, whereas when vendors mention the ADI test, a material has passed the ADI test, you should investigate whether or not the manufacturer did the test or if they had some outside vendor do the test. Um, in the test samples, in, or sorry, in the test, the samples are sandwiched between filter paper, polyester sheet, and various detectors with a sheet of glass at the top and bottom, and then a standardized weight at the top. So the detectors um, that are sandwiched in there, they screen for materials that can cause fading, silver mirroring, discoloration, and yellowing of the support, which are common um, degradation problems, uh, changes that occur with photographic materials. Um, so actually, an article was published just this past month um, in JAIC, the journal for the American Institute of Conservation, by Eric Brighting at the Met and others, comparing the PAT test to the Audi test, which is really interesting. And um, they remind us that these tests were designed to identify materials that cause changes to metals specifically, or these very specific um, materials. However, we actually use the results to assess how a product might interact in the broader context um, with many different substrates and object types, even though there might not be a direct correlation to how they perform in the test. Um, Eric's lab also carries out an Audi test for paper, which I have listed here, um, which he developed at the Library of Congress. Um, and so this can help us see how a product might interact with cellulose-based objects. Instead of metal coupons, paper is used within the test um, to see how it interacts and what degradation products are produced after accelerated aging in the presence of the product. And then the last test that I have listed here is a color fastness test. Um, Color fastness of a product may be important or of interest, but it won't necessarily tell us how a product will interact with an artifact. Um, and blue wool standard cards like the one shown in the center 
of the at the bottom of the screen um, provide a standard for us to understand how quickly a product will fade with light exposure. Okay. So this brings us to instrumental analysis. So lastly, we have um, various tech testing techniques that are commonly found, um, or I guess of the various testing techniques that are commonly found in museum science labs, the most commonly used techniques um, for this type of testing is, or for evaluation, this type of evaluation, um, our GCMS, or gas chromatography mass spectrometry, and SPME, also, which is called SPME, um, which is solid phase micro extraction. SPME is actually a method for um, extracting and introducing a sample to the GC instrument. Okay, so to explain this, I am going to grossly simplify the process. Um, gas chromatography is a method of separating various chemical components in a sample. Uh, for example, the sample might be a plastic that you're interested in using to pad them out. Um, the plastic will give off a complex mixture of chemicals, and depending on how long it takes for each of those chemicals in the mixture to pass through the instrument, you can characterize it. So that's what you're seeing on the chromatogram down below. Um, the x axis is time. So um, each chemical come off, comes off at a different time. Then each of those chemicals can be assessed with mass spectrometry, um, which provides the mass of the material um, and that the computer <laughs> can identify um, each of the compounds by their um, their element, their mass. So, and then uh, when compared to a known standard, you can also know relatively how much of each of those compounds is present. So this tool can be really helpful for weeding out materials that contain known harmful chemicals. Um, what we haven't figured out yet is how much of the chemical needs to be present for it to be harmful. So um, just because camphor is present in this sample, so you can see in the center, one of the peaks labeled as camphor, it doesn't mean that it's present in the quantities that would actually be a problem for our collection objects. Um, and as we learned, this will be really different depending on the vulnerability of the object and the context that the, um, in which the material, the product is used. So, whether or not you do your own testing, you may be wondering where can you find test results for products besides on product literature. <clears throat> so this is where the materials testing results page on the AIC wiki comes in. There is in-depth information um, on the Audi test on AIC's wiki site and usefully tables that provide results from almost 3,000 tests that have been submitted by major institutions around the world. And I want to acknowledge the support of Rachel Ehrenstein, the AIC e-editor, who's always looking for ways to improve the site, Eric Brighting at the Met, whose lab is a major contributor to the of results, and Gopian, who um, provided funding for some recent change updates to the pages to make them more user-friendly. So these tables are not meant to be used to recommend or discourage use of any particular material, but they do provide useful information that taken into context can aid in decision making. It is essential to look at the test protocol and the date and remember that manufacturers can change products over time. So think about who is providing the information, um, who carried out the test, the company who is selling you the product or an, someone else. When was the test done? Um, is this the same product lot, same manufacturer, same supplier? Um, what test was used and what can we glean from that information? And I'll really quickly go over, there's two ways to view the results um, that are on this table. Um, Okay, so the simple or table view allows you to quickly view the compiled data in a grid format. 
it's the classic wiki table format. Um, and by clicking on the header, you can do a simple, all of the, the um, columns are sortable. Uh, primarily, Audi test results are shown here, but there are results from all the types of tests that I mentioned represented. Um, for mobile devices, I recommend using the search builder or the card view. Um, you can uh, you can switch between the views at the top left by hitting the search builder or um, simple view button. So let's look at the search builder or the card view, as I call it. Um, this is also excellent for more complicated or specific searches. So in this view, you'll only see 10 results on a page. Um, you There's a simple search field to filter uh, results, but then you can also build uh, a search by specific column um, field. So uh, this is really great for filtering out the older test results. So maybe you only wanna see results from the past five years, you would choose date tested, and then your condition would be after a specific date. <clears throat> okay, so that brings me to my conclusion. So, okay, hopefully now, um, remember, we hopefully now remember why material choices are important. Um, we have some new tools to evaluate the vulnerabilities of our collections. We have ways to think critically about the threat and context of our decisions. Um, we can better understand how to interpret the information that's out there. And when we need more information, we can ask our conservation and conservation science colleagues um, smart questions about testing. And so that brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. I wanna thank C2C and FAIC again for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I hope that I demystified some of the types of testing out there used to assess products um, that we use with collections and that I gave you some places to turn to um, online or maybe even on your own bookshelf to help you make decisions in the future. Um, thank you to my many colleagues who allowed me to use images and apologies to Roy Lichtenstein whose images were exploited for this presentation. And so, yeah, I think we have time for questions. I'm happy to answer them. And um, so we can, I guess I can stop sharing. Is that right, Robin? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Samantha. That okay. was great. Thank you. Um, I'll also add that in the chat, I just added links to our resources or just the homepage, which has a, uh, can links out to a resource document that Smith put together, which has links to all the fabulous resources she talked about, and a copy of the presentation with the Lichtenstein scrubbed out of it, because we all know copyright laws, but it is, all the data is there in the presentation for us to see. Um, also in that chat is our survey link before we start going to the q and I always like to post it because if you can take a few minutes to fill out the survey for this program, it is always appreciated. Um, we already have a couple questions popping into the chat, so I'll go ahead and start hitting them um, while we're here. So our first question is, what are your thoughts on the accuracy of, say, just a simple line of code pH testing pen or something similar? So let's say like you're a small midsize and you're kind of dealing with limited budget. Um, what are your thoughts on that or any other tips you might have for people who want to test? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, uh, so um, I think they're really great for, um, if you know in your head, kind of like that it might not be the most accurate, but uh, a way that you can kind of, I think you should test them. Like maybe you have one stashed in your desk that you haven't used for 10 years. <laughs> and so, um, for any of these tests that I mentioned, uh, for using them effectively, you want to compare it to a known, um, a known positive and a known negative. So if you want to, if you have materials that you know, like one's acidic, one's basic, uh, you know, maybe it has some uh, the calcium carbonate built into it, um, and it's buffered, and then you have one neutral, you can compare your unknown to those knowns. And that is a really great way to make sure that you are, um, have, or at least to dial in the accuracy of these tools that are uh, a little bit more vague. 
or don't have quite as clear accuracy. Yeah. I always think back to, um, you know, obviously you want to trust the manufacturer. That's the hope, right? But it's also good to run those little tests just to make sure that the stuff you're using is accurate. I think back to my million years ago days when I worked retail and we had those counterfeit pens that you would put on the hundred dollar bill. And I'd always be like, well, I won't know. And I guess they're real. <laughs> like, it's like, you know what I mean? You were kind of guessing. So I think it's nice to be able to do a little kind of in-house test to be like, yeah, no, this is accurate. So that's a very good point. Um, someone posts <laughs> thoughts on the curator claims that we don't need to worry about light levels or long exposure for this photographic print as the vendor says it will last 200 years. It's a new magical process. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, okay. What are my thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I think that you don't enter the conservation field unless you are a skeptic. <laughs> so of course I'd be skeptical of that. Um, there are testing methods like the microfading test, microfade testing that can be done to um, get more data about that. And so those are things that you might look into if it exists for that uh, new printing process. Um, but like almost everything is uh, sensitive to light. And so, um, yeah, the new magical process is probably, I, I like they're saying it will last 200 years. Where? In the dark? I don't know. At room temperature? I don't know. So um, again, the context really matters. Yeah. And if I had to guess, it's something like they're, they're probably saying like, don't worry about, you know what I mean? Like we can, yeah. I mean- I, it is nice now that with current um, light, like LED lights and stuff, it doesn't burn as hot when you're in interior, you know, positions or you can, if you if you have the money to switch to those kind of things, that's really useful. But yeah, I always sit there and wonder too, like, what is the testing that you're doing? I know CCI back in, I think they still do, do testing sometimes, Canadian Conservation Institute, they'll do long-term testing on certain things to see um, how long they last. Like they used to do it back in the the days of CD storage. Um, it was always the talk yeah. of how long will the CDs last and stuff like that. But. They also they also have a really great tool. So if you can find out what um, colorants this uh, photographic process uses, so if they are carbon based, um, carbon based colorants are more uh, light fast than others. So um, I believe it's CCI also has a tool online where you can look at the kind of predictability of um, certain colorants and how quickly they might fade. And you can use that as a tool to show your curator, maybe like, oh, we know that this photograph or the manufacturer of this process says they're using these types of colorants. And we know that those generally don't last you know, or they'll fade with this amount of exposure. So we should still limit it um, and be careful about what we're doing. Yeah. And I would encourage anyone, if you want to do some fun digging, go head over to the Canadian Conservation Institute website and they have some fun stuff to go read over there. So about all that kind of stuff. So I would encourage everyone to go research that. Um, I do like what someone said in the chat said also working in museums sometimes you're dealing with 200 year old artifacts. Why should we doom people 200 years from now by ignoring proper preservation of those <laughs> prints? Agree. <laughs> like, so good point. Um, yeah, it is It is interesting to think that way, right? Because I think we've all seen treatments that people, the one that's, that rises to my brain is encapsulation, right? Which was like the hot thing back in the day. And now we look at it, we're like, oof, that's going to be encapsulated for all time now. So or it's very hard to reverse. So good point. Um, when items are described as volatile, like VOCs, is that term being used in the chemical context, evaporates easily in simple terms, or is more of a colloquial term? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, like, in my mind, it means very specific things, but in, um, so I, I, but in product literature, you'll see VOCs, and it is like, organic compounds that off gas, they're volatile because they are um, going into the air. And so that is generally what we're talking about. And so those might be things like acetic acid, which you think of as it's vinegar, it's in the liquid, but it actually evaporates into the air or 
formic acid, which evaporates into the air and then can cause other problems with your collection object. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, someone's asking, can you share a little more about the materials working groups, recent discussion suggestions for standardizing audit test protocols and results for reporting? Do you have any um, thoughts on that? Yeah. So they, so the materials working group has a, um, one section that is working on that and they've been do there's some information about the process that they've been using um they're calling it a round robin because they have their like have their test and they have various different organizations doing the same test and they're pulling starting to pull all of the data together um the results from that to see if they can make any correlations or if they can see you know okay if we all test the same way then are we getting the same results from the tests so that is something that they're just starting to do so we, we don't have any results from that just yet um but if you're really interested um the materials working group is having a meeting um in the fall and so um i think uh becky who's our chair she just posted uh, about the meeting so you can register and attend um it's so that is a that's a possibility um to get more information about it if you're interested in participating we're all volunteers so <laughs> it's a really Perfect. fun group great thank you um okay so it looks like we've gone through all the questions but i'll kind of hang out for a little bit just to make sure no one else wants to pop anything in there um, one thing that really struck me as you were saying about how conservators are skeptics, I always say that registrars are pragmatists, like pragmatists, like we're very <laughs> realistic and we're very like, this is just what we have. <laughs> so I do like the fact, I feel like that's like our two, our two communities get along well together because it's just like two sides of one coin in a lot of ways. Um, oh, someone, someone just posted. So they said, what would be an example of do your due diligence on plywood slash paint if your, or if your organization makes... I think they made pedestals. Does that make sense? Yeah. So okay. So again, you would I would start with um, start with looking at the SDS. I mean, so you're talking about painted plywood. I mean, these these are things that we plywood we know is a problematic um, wood in general. Um, is problematic for not for everything, but for a lot of um, collection materials. So, um, you know, you can look at the product literature, you can, there's lots of information out there that talks about the problems that are caused by paint and um, plywood um, and that uh, the resources that I shared. So you can look at those to help um, make decisions about um, whether or not you want to create a barrier layer, you know, um, some sort of a zone between your within your vitrine to isolate between the air in the vitrine and the um, case itself. Um, I would look at the um, the exhibition guidelines on the AIC wiki that help can help you decide. You know, should this be a um, a leaky case versus a sealed case? Um, so things like that. And yeah, I see like you're talking about for display. So the exhibition guidelines on the AIC Wiki are, are a really great resource for helping to make decisions about um, how, yes, what you should, when you have your case that's made out of wood and paint, then what else should I do in order to protect my objects? Perfect. Thank you. Well, with that, we're at time. Um, a huge thank you, Samantha, for taking your time for putting together this program. It was greatly appreciated. I did just put again the link to the resources and the survey link in the chat. So please click on those if you have a chance. Um, a huge thank out to thank you to FAIC and IMLS for as always supporting the C2C Care program. Um, just a quick reminder that we do have our upcoming free webinar on August 20th that I encourage you to go register for. And we also have that course happening in September. So if you're interested in developing your policy, go check that out as well. So thanks again, Samantha. Uh, we will see you all in August. And until then, attempt to stay cool in North America. And we will see you all later in the summer. Thanks again. Thank you.